Hello and welcome to today's webinar. This is the second of two webinars this month on the topic of uh, plant circadian rhythms. Today we have three speakers, James Locke, Don Nagel, and Todd Michael. Our host is Alex Webb and our moderator is Eva Herrero Serrano. We're having this, these webinars uh, in honor of the plant physiology focus issue on circadian rhythms, which is the October 2022 focus issue. It's edited by Stacy Harmer, Alex Webb, and Christian Funkhauser. And you can see this beautiful cover um, designed by one of our speakers today, Todd Michael. This issue is online now. This webinar will be recorded and posted to the Plante YouTube channel, where you can find the webinar from earlier this month, as well as a whole bunch of other plant physiology and plant cell focus issue webinars. I'd like to give a special thank you to ASPB members who are in attendance. If you're not a member and you'd like to support this program, um, you can use the code PRESENTS10 to receive 10% off your membership dues. Please put questions for the speakers into the questions box. If you're having difficulties, you can email me, mwilliams at ASPB.org. Um, and if you're having trouble with audio or anything, just um, close out and come back in again. So now I'm going to turn this over to Alex, who will tell us a bit more about the, the focus issue. Thank you, Mary. Um, I'll just share. Please let me know if the sharing's not working. Let's try that one. Is that all good, Mary? Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone, thank you. Uh, welcome to our Circadian Clocks Focus Issue webinar. Um, webinar sorry. Um, we must give credit to Kelly as well in the Todd Michael group for this fantastic cover, which we're all going to use for years to come. It's a beautiful cover. Um, and as you heard, uh, Stacey Harmer, myself, and Christian Fankhauser were asked to um, edit this issue, and we were very keen that we did something a little bit different with this issue, which I think we've achieved, and is that we really wanted to capture both in our updates and our research articles, um, the profound influence of the circadian system on plant physiology, and really also to capture the fact that over the last 25 years, we've really learned a lot about the system. And I think when moving into a new phase of uh, experimentation and analysis, um, and really the next sort of, uh, second generation of circadian research in plants, perhaps, or maybe the third. Um, you're all aware that we live on a rotating planet. And of course, this rotating planet gives us cycles of both light, dark, and warm and cold, particularly as we move away from the equator, these cycles can become quite profound. Obviously, for a photosynthetic organism, adapting to these cycles of light and dark is very important, and also being able to anticipate the light and dark confers advantage to the plant. And the circadian system provides both that adaptation and that anticipation of the light dark cycle. But I think we perhaps don't often think about the importance of the temperature cycle. And I think that is something that I believe is equally important. And certainly if you live where I do, quite far north up in Cambridge, the daily cycle can be the same as the yearly cycle. So the mean temperature cycle for the U uh, for Cambridge in the UK is 20 degrees in the summer and four degrees in the winter. And we can have exactly that daily cycle, four degrees at night, 20 degrees during the day. So it's very important for the plant to be able to distinguish between daily and seasonal changes in temperature and a circadian clock both responds to these signals and helps the plant adapt to them. And we'll hear more about that later, I think. And I think we're all aware of that pervasive effect on, of the circadian system on our own bodies. And in fact, one of the problems when organizing something like these webinars is what time of day to have the webinar, because we're all living on different parts of the planet. And the effect is so profound that nobody can bear to be watching a science seminar at two o'clock in the morning because we need to be asleep. But it's not only the sleep-wake cycle which is affected profoundly by the clock, there's many other aspects of human physiology, such as um, body temperature, blood pressure, activity cycles, and so on, which are under circadian control from the suprachiasmatic nucleus, regulating the production of melatonin and other hormones to influence the rest of the body. 
And I think this this was known to the the influence of daily cycles on human physiology was certainly known to the Greeks and probably long before then. But in fact, it's not just humans which have rhythms, it's plants as well. And when we think about this, we have this hugely rhythmic environment. And if we think about the biology of the plant in a light dark cycle, for example, here we've depicted a crop, wheat, growing in the field, there is a huge influence of the daily rhythm on the plant. So for example, during the day, it tends to be warmer. For C3 and C4 plants, the stomata are open. That means water is being lost from the plant. Carbon dioxide is being taken up to drive photosynthesis. Those, that CO2 is being turned into sugars, and those sugars are used either to feed uh, growth and respiration, or they're stored either for seasonal storage or for actually the daily cycle as well. And we'll come back to that. And actually, all plants, well, most plants, accumulate a water deficit. They actually gamble. So they accumulate more water deficit during the day than, than uh, they could recover if there wasn't the night cycle in which they can replenish their water. So they actually gamble that it will get dark and are able to replenish their water. And then during the night, we have a completely different cycle of activity. It tends to be colder. For C3 and C4 plants, the stomata are closed, but respiration still needs to occur. So sugars which have been stored during the day, consumed at night uh, for respiration and also to maintain growth. And that's an amazing system. In fact, in most plants, that stored sugar is consumed to almost zero at almost exactly dawn um, in a very clearly temporally controlled system. But whether the circadian clock is involved and how it's involved is still controversial. So we have a very rhythmic both external environment and internal metabolism in the plant. And in fact, the circadian rhythms were famously first discovered in plants, um, just like genetics, RNA interference, gaseous hormones, transposons, photoperiodism, etc. And they were discovered by a French researcher called de, Mar de Maran, who found it so uninteresting, he never published his results. And they were actually written up by a friend of him as a sort of passing conversation. And what did we think he was studying? He described heliotropes, and he put his heliotropes in a cupboard which was in a, uh, a, sorry, in a case wrapped in a blanket in a closed cupboard and measured the rhythms of leaf movement to ensure there's no effect from external environment. And we think he was studying mimosa plants, the famous sensitive plant. And here's some images that Anthony Dodd took when he was in my lab many years ago of some mimosa plants growing in constant light. And you can see both the leaf, whole leaf moves up and down with a 24 hour rhythm and indeed the leaflets close up and down with a 24 hour rhythm. And it was from this that de Marain, uh concluded that there was some kind of internal clockwork which could drive rhythms in plants. And we now know that this is a circadian clockwork. We describe it as circadian because it is capable of free running. And because of its free running behavior and that it can continue to offer the definition of a circadian clock is that the behavior will oscillate with a period near 24 hour in constant conditions. We know that that must be driven by an internal oscillator. Though, of course, actually, evolution has not directly selected for the presence of an oscillator. The oscillator is an emergent property of the selection for the behavior of plants in a light dark cycle. And that desire to be able to anticipate daily events, sequence daily events, and moderate signaling in response to external signals. And it turns out that uh, by evolution that an oscillator is perhaps the best way to achieve this. And that's what results in the free running rhythms. And over the last 25 years, intensive research by many labs has essentially resolved the nature of that oscillator, or at least part of the oscillator uh, in Arabidopsis. And we believe it broadly applies to other species as well. So we have in the morning uh, a mid-like transcription factor, which acts as a repressor for a group of pseudo response regulators, um, which are also transcriptional repressors, which feed in to another group of transcriptional repressors, the so-called evening complex based on LUX, which is a DNA binding protein and accessory proteins L3 and L4, which feed back again to regulate LHY, CCA1, the mid-like transcription factors. So we have a transcriptional feedback loop switching gene expression on and off, but that's not enough. You've also got to regulate the turnover of the proteins and that moderated turnover of proteins on a daily basis occurs through Zeitlupa, an E3 ubiquitin ligase, 
and Gigantia, which may act as a scaffold protein and also a moderator of E3 ubiquitin ligase activity in Zeitlupa. So we have oscillating feedback between transcription factors, setting up oscillating gene expression, and then we have daily turnover of proteins to increase the amplitude of that oscillating gene expression. And we also know, and I think uh, perhaps even more importantly, that this regulates a huge swathe of biology. It regulates um, uh, gene expression, of course. It regulates interactions with other organisms. It regulates growth, um, leaf movement, stomatal movements, photosynth photosynthesis, uh, metabolism. And it also, the circadian clock, modulates the signals that regulate it. So to have a circadian system, it can only be useful if it can lock to the day and night cycle. And that's done through light signals feeding into the clock to set circadian timing and temperature signals feeding into the clock to regulate circadian timing. But the clock also modulates both light signaling and uh, temperature signaling such that the plant can interpret the time of day at which it is receiving light and temperature signals. And we know a huge amount about the basic uh, underlying molecular mechanisms now. And so we have our entrainment pathways consider, consisting of red and blue light signaling. And we're beginning to understand that often involves uh, protein turnover of regulators of the circadian oscillator or parts of the circadian oscillator. So we have inputs from dawn and dusk, but we also have our transcriptional feedback loop. Here's our mid-light transcription factors, pseudo response regulators, and our evening complex uh, regulators acting in sequence and regulating each other to set up the oscillator. And then we have our outputs, which are changes in physiology, metabolism, gene expression, and development. And traditionally, we think of the signal information th flow through the system in this direction, entrainment from light and dark signals through light signaling pathways and temperature pathways less well resolved into the transcriptional oscillator, and that regulates the outputs. But I think we're also beginning to see evidence that there is an, another direction for the information flow, that some of these outputs can regulate the behavior of the oscillator. So for example, um, outputs of photosynthesis can regulate the behavior of the oscillator, and the oscillator can regulate information flow coming into it through the process of circadian gating, modulating light and temperature signaling. And luckily, I'm pleased to say we've got articles which address all of these areas. We have two updates in, uh, discussing the mechanisms of entrainment, one from my own lab discussing uh, molecular mechanisms and purposes of in circadian entrainment. Um, you're going to hear from James today, who's written a very nice update looking at spatial aspects of um, circadian function. That's both cell-specific function of the clock, but also the way in which they might communicate and share information to regulate uh, behavior between cells. And then we have uh, a research article from Seth Davis's lab looking at the role of early flowering three um, and how it is res responds to light input into the circadian system. We have a couple of really nice articles, one update and one research article, um, looking at the evolution of the clock system uh, through the green lineage, the, the, particularly the oscillator system, and uh, one from uh, Maria Mittag, um, and, uh, and today from Todd um, Michael, you'll be hearing about his beautiful research on the gene linkage, which has occurred during the development of circadian clocks. And then in outputs, we have more uh, publications. And I think that represents the way the field is going in that we're really beginning to get down to the functions of the clock and, and less focus on the mechanism. So we have two very nice updates um, looking at uh, plant mod uh, clock modifications for adapting flowering time to local environments um, and also the adaptive nature of the plant circadian clock in natural environments. And then we have uh, some nice research articles, one of which can, uh, from Lee Wang's lab, considering how the circadian clock um, ABA signaling is regulated by the circadian clock through CCA1. We have uh, Dawn Nagel, who will be speaking to us today with her very nice tool for visualize, visualizing the circadian regulation of outputs. And a very nice study um, from Glenn Urich's lab, looking at the role of Rivelli genes and how they regulate carbohydrate metabolism and the proteasome. Very nice. So today, as you've heard, we've got James Locke, who's from the Sainsbury Laboratory here in Cambridge, sitting about a kilometre away from me. 
We have Dawn Nagel from Riverside, sitting probably about 10,000 kilometers away from me, and Todd Michael from the Salk Institute, about 10,000 kilometers away from me. And sitting about 10 meters away is our um, moderator today, which is Ava uh, Serrano. And Ava uh, had a very important role in, in discovering the function of L3, one of the contributors to discover the function of L3 during her PhD. Um, subsequently went to do a PA, uh, postdoc at, these, um, at the Crick Institute in London and has been in my lab for three years working on TTG1 proteins in the clock and now has her own independent brew bank fellowship in the Department of Plant Sciences. So I'll pass over to Ava who will moderate the session. Oh, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, it's a pleasure to be moderating this webinar today. And before I introduce the first speaker, I will I want to remind you to write the, if you have any questions, to write them in the question and answer box. And I will read out some questions at the end of each talk. So uh, now I will introduce the first speaker, that is uh, uh, James Locke. So James is a group leader at the Sainsbury Laboratory uh, at the University of Cambridge. And his group is interested in how different types of gene expression dynamics are generated and what are the consequences for organisms. And uh, he's interested in uh, dynamics of uh, robust, robust oscillations like circadian uh, oscillations in plants and also more stochastic pulses of gene expression that are observed in bacterial stress response pathways. Uh, his group uses a combination of time-lapse microscopy, mathematical modeling, modeling and synthetic biology to understand the design principles behind dynamic gene regulation. So James, uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you very much. And <clears throat> thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to chat about our update review concerning spatially specific mechanisms and functions of the plant circadian clock. So this review was written with Professor uh, Matomo Endo, as well as William Davis, a PhD student in my group. And as Alex just introduced so nicely, one aspect of the review we wanted to cover was how the circadian clock in plants appears to have many spatially specific functions. So it controls processes throughout the day and night, but also uh, in very particular parts of the plant, Um, it can modulate flowering time or flower opening during the day. It can modulate senescence, stomatal opening, photosynthesis, leaf movement. Going into the root, it can affect lateral root emergence timing and also even microbiome composition by modulating the, the uh, composition of root exudate. So it's clear that, as Alex said, it's this pervasive regulator of development in plants. But what's fun and very interesting is that beyond this range of um, pathways that it's, it's controlling, it's clear that the clock itself can also have spatial differences in different tissues or in different parts of the plant. And these differences might play a role in allowing it to have so many different functions across the plant. So the reason why we know this is that there's been uh, a series of technical advances that allow us to examine the spatial specificity of circadian rhythms. So for example, um, we can now use single cell confocal microscopy of either uh, reporters for core clock genes at the level of transcription or, or at the protein level that allow us to track single cell rhythms of the oscillations in individual cells of the plant across the plant and look at differences. Um, also, people have developed thermal imaging techniques that allow us to look at tissue specific uh, rhythms without needing transgenics. Also, you can use tissue-specific split luciferase assays to examine luciferase reporters of clock function in specific tissues rather than averaging over the whole plant. And finally, an, another useful technique which is beginning to be used is single-cell RNA-seq, where you can isolate individual cells and look at the phase of the clock in specific tissues and see, see the differences. Okay, so in the review, we go on to talk about how these different techniques are allowing us to reveal these differences in rhythms in different parts of the plant. But what I was asked to do today was talk specifically about research in my group that's relevant um, to this topic. So it's one aspect of this that we're trying to develop in my group is a spatial model of the plant's circadian clock 
where we can try and capture some of these differences between different tissues. Okay, so why do we want to do that? So over the last uh, couple of decades, a combination of mathematical modeling and experiment has allowed us to go from a one loop mathematical model of the circadian clock in plants to this complex multi-feedback loop model that Alex Webb just introduced. But these mathematical models of the plant's circadian clock are derived from bulk studies, so averages of the clock rhythm across many plants. And so they're ignoring these differences between different parts of the plant that I've just been telling you about and you can read about in the review. So there's many more than this, but examples include the fact that there's evidence that the shoot clock can drive the clock rhythms in the root. And also people have observed spatial waves of gene expression in the root and also in the leaves. So we want to try and build a mathematical model that can try and explain these dynamics and start to understand them. And so to do that, we need to build this spatial model of the plant's circadian clock. Okay, so the work today that I'm going to tell you about is a collaboration between um, Izel Tokuda um, at Wright Sumikan University, and also was led by a very talented PhD student in my group, Mark Greenwood, who's now doing a postdoc at MIT. And what we were trying to do effectively is take a simplified model of the core clock network of Arabidopsis, apply it to a plant template, and try and understand how we can use these clock models to generate the type of dynamics we're seeing experimentally. Okay, so what is the type of dynamics that we're trying to capture? So, so one of the key aspects that we try to capture with the model is that if you look at the single cell level across the plant, you can see these specific differences in clock timing. So here, this is one example um, of confocal microscopy of a reporter for a core clock gene, CCA1. And these plants have been growing under light dark cycles and then run under constant conditions. And then we've measured the period, so the time it takes for one cycle of the oscillation. And each dot here is one individual cell of the plant. So in the cotyledon and the hypocotyl, the clock runs relatively fast compared to the root. So the clock is running faster in the, in the aerial tissue than the root. And then when you go down into the root tip, you can see suddenly that the clock runs faster still. So this spatial structure to the clock speed across the plant. Okay, so we would like our mathematical model of the plant to capture this. But what does this look like in a movie? Okay, so this differences in clock timing when you watch movies, either a single cell confocal microscopy, or in this case, um, sub-tissue level luciferase imaging of a clock gene reveals these spatial ways of clock gene expression that other labs have also observed previously. So you can see the root tip upwards, we see a, a wave of clock gene expression, and also a wave coming from the hypocotyl down into the root. Okay, so we can quantify those, those waves. And so this is a chymograph showing over time, as we release the plant into constant light, coming from the hypocotyl down into the root. And this dark line here is the peak of expression. And so you can see with each cycle, because the root is running slower, you can see the wave going down into the root as the clock time at the peak of clock expression gets later and later. But also you see that the root tip is peaking before the rest of the root. And so this is the wave going up the root. Okay, so what we would like our mathematical model to do is both capture these period differences in the different parts of the plant, but also these spatial waves that we see when we look at the clock um, in movies. Okay, so the first question we wanted to address was, do you need a long distance signal from one part of the plant to another to generate these spatial waves? And so to address this um, in previous work, Mark tried cutting the plant into different parts and see if we could affect the wave. And what we saw, so this break here represents where he, he's cut the hypocotyl away from the top of the root, and here he's cut the root tip away from, from the hypocotyl. And what you can hopefully see is that the wave still continues through the different separated pieces of tissue. So it doesn't seem that we need a long distance signal to generate these waves. However, there is signaling between cell to cell. So what we found um, from our single cell studies, but also other labs are seeing something similar, 
is that although we don't need a long distance signal for the spatial waves, there does appear to be evidence of local clock coupling. So here, um, from this single cell confocal movie, cells which were close to each other over time, their rhythms became more similar, especially in regions with high cell density. So in this case, the root tip. So at high cell density, this measure of coupling strength increases. And people have seen similar things in other labs um, in the shoot apex. So there appears to be communication from cell to cell that's local. So one cell is telling the cell next door what time of day it thinks it is, and they're averaging the response. OK, so going back to what we want to put into the model, we can put this local coupling into the model and see if this is enough to generate uh, spatial waves. But this local cell to cell coupling on its own isn't enough to generate the period differences that we measure across the plant. We need some reason why the clock is running at different speeds in the shoot compared to the root and the root tip. So there's two possible reasons. One is perhaps, or that we can think of, one is that there's different clock architectures in different parts of the plant, which there's definite experimental evidence for. And two, um, the clock period differences could be due to different sensitivity to inputs. I don't have time to go through the evidence today, but um, at least for the core clock mutations that we looked at, it didn't appear that they disrupted the wave in, in a significant way. But when we played with the sensitivity to the inputs by modulating the environment, we could shift the wave pattern quite, quite significantly. So here, uh, when we run the plant into constant darkness rather than constant light, the period of the clock in the shoot runs slower, and you lose the wave down into the root and you just keep the wave up the root. So now we've got one wave going from the root tip up into, up into the root. Similarly, in a 5B mutation under red light, you can actually get rid of all the spatial waves and just have a straight, a, a straight rhythm that's the same in the top of the root, middle, and the bottom. OK, so based on these two experimental observations, we can go back to what we want to try and put into this mathematical model of the plant clock to try and explain the experiments. So the hypothesis is, if we allow local cell-to-cell -cell coupling that we have evidence from, from single cell studies, so in this case, we're allowing CCA1 levels to be averaged with its neighbors, and we also input this core clock network into, in this case, there are 800 cells in our template, but in different parts of the plant, we say the sensitivity to the light is different. So you're more sensitive to light in the cotyledon than the hypocotyl, less in the root and high again in the root tip. Is this differential sensitivity to light or to the environment combined with local cell to cell coupling enough to generate something that looks like the experiment? <coughs> so this is an example of a type of simulation that we observe. And what you can hopefully see is something that looks um, qualitatively similar to experiment. So. In the simulations, we can generate the wave down from the hypocotyl into the root and also up from the root tip. Okay, so again, this doesn't necessarily make this correct, but it's enough to show that just those two hypotheses are enough to generate the dynamics that we can observe. Okay, so we can quantify these movies and see that the experimental waves we see going down from the hypocotyl into the root and up from the root tip can be matched qualitatively in our simulations. And if, here, if you take one cycle and you can look at the peak, peak time of the clock and experiment versus simulation, you can see the spatial wave patterns in both. And the fun thing with the simulation now that we built it is you can play with the level of local coupling and see how it affects the spatial waves. So here, as we go to the right, I'm increasing the strength of the local coupling. And what you can hopefully see is without local coupling and just with the different sensitivities to inputs, you don't get spatial waves. But as you increase the strength of the local coupling, then the spatial waves start to form. Okay, so we've also examined the effects of long distance coupling, but I don't have time to discuss it here. But it's interesting to think about the combinations of local and long distance coupling and how that might allow clock coordination in the plant. <coughs> but what you might be asking is, is there any function or use of this local cell-to-cell -cell coupling 
plus the sensitivity to inputs being different across the plant. And so we think we have we might have one option for why this might produce a functional use for the plant or might have some design principle that could be useful, which is that if you take the simulations from the plant and you um, entrain the plant using square wave light dark cycles, which are not noisy, okay, so like idealized light dark cycles, versus the case where you give each cell a noisy light dark cycle or entrainment queue. And then you look at the effect on the output of the ribbons in the two cases, non-noisy or noisy. What you can see is as you increase for local coupling strength, the differences between the not noisy, which are the black dots versus the red dots, which is the noisy cycle, become less and less as you increase the coupling strength. So what's happening is each cell is averaging um, the environmental input between it due to the local coupling, and you end up getting much closer closer accurate answer compared to what the idealized light, light, light dark cycle would suggest. So you can see this here, the, as we increase the coupling strength, the cell timing error, so the difference between what time the clock thinks it is in the noisy versus non-noisy light dark cycle gets reduced as you increase the coupling strength, both in terms of the error in the peak timing, but also the, the error in the trough timing. Okay. So to summarize, we hope that these types of spatial clock models can start to make testable predictions concerning the coordination of the plant's circadian clock. We think that a combination of this local cell to cell coupling plus different sensitivity to the environment can generate these spatial ways of clock gene expression that we can observe in our movies. And we think that this local coupling and regional sensitivity could allow these robust oscillations that we can see can filter out the noise in the environment but also allow flexible timing. So still allow the root tip to peak earlier than the rest of the root, or the shoot to run at a different time than the root or the root tip. Okay, so if you're interested in these results, you can talk about, you can um, hear more about the model um, in this paper that's been recently published. And if you'd like to hear about all the things that our model can't capture, you can read our update review. Okay, so just to say thanks to William Davis and Professor Endo, um, who worked together really fun on the update review that's been published in Plant Physiology. And on the right hand side, I'd just like to thank my collaborators and, and lab members who worked on the plant model and the single cell work. Okay, thank you very much. Ava, are you there? I wonder if Ava has frozen. I think she has frozen because yeah. Oh, shoot. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> so I can I can see the questions in Great. the chat. Why don't you pick a couple for us? Thank you. Thank you, Ava. Well, that's for you. Uh, okay. Uh, great. I don't know what order they came in, but I can attempt to uh, not pick the ones that I don't like. Um, okay. So let's start, let's start from the bottom. Oh, so uh, here's one question for Arjun, which is, do you think that there are any major changes in an older plant than the seedings you looked at? Would coupling-based ways be able to function across meter scales? So this is a great question and something that we want to look at because obviously all we've looked at so far in our movies are these relatively small seedlings. And as the plant grows, it's, it's clear that it shouldn't necessarily scale, that the ways will look the way that they do in, in these small small distances. And perhaps the balance between long distance coupling and the local coupling might be different at different developmental times. times. So this is something we really want to look at um, in further experiments. And I, I think it's really exciting to think about um, whether the rules of how the clock coordinates its timing varies during the development or not. Um, okay. The, I, I don't have an idea of timing, um, but I'm going to let myself have one more question. Uh, Perfect. All right. um, okay. Um, so uh, uh, the next question in the list is, um, one purpose of a clock might be to define the phase of processes under zeitgeist cycles that change gradually over time rather than have square waves. To what extent might coupling be necessary under those conditions? 
Uh, right. Okay. So I think I think the question is saying that obviously the square waves that we're giving or the idealized square waves aren't don't really match the environment because it'd be much more like a gradual sine wave in terms of light um, during the day and night. Um, and that's actually something that we're we're examining in our movies. We're we're trying to see how um, the clock waves or how the pattern of the clock changes when we give sine waves versus square waves. Um, in terms of coupling, it's still possible to have a noisy sine wave just as it is to have a, a noisy square wave as we did in our simulations. And I think the differences between an idealized sine wave and a noisy sine wave would still lead to similar conclusions, but we should check that in the model. Okay, so I think I'm out of time. Thank you, James. So, um, Alex says, uh, do you wanna introduce Dawn? I'll put the link in the chat if that's helpful. Okay, uh, uh, Ava is just uh, restarting her computer. It just locked up. Um, so the next speaker is uh, Dawn Nagel at um, Riverside University. Um, I haven't got the title in front of me, so because I can only see James's screen at the moment. Yeah, so I Dawn, think I'm going to yes. people. Sorry, let, let, let me stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, I've, I've stopped sharing. Right. I, anyway, so Dawn, maybe just go ahead. There we go. Circadian regulation of temperature sensing responses in plants. Um, it doesn't view quite right, Dawn, yet. Yes, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working okay, on no, it. Okay, no problem. Yeah, I was trying to change the settings from earlier so that it's easier. Can you see this now? Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So go ahead, Dawn. Looking forward okay. to it. So thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Um, and thank you for Stacy and Frank, along with Alex, for organizing this focus issue. And also to Mary and Ava for the invitation to participate. So my lab studies how the circadian clock interacts with the environment and how it senses uh, temperature signals to control many different responses in plants. You've seen this really great uh, uh, introduction from Alex earlier um, with a little bit more detail, looking at how this circadian oscillator can take information from the environment, primarily through light signals, temperature signals, and metabolites, and synchronize a variety of uh, biological processes that are important for plant growth and adaptation. Many of these processes, many of the function, many most of the function of the circadian clock. Um, by reg for regulating these processes are through the regulation of gene expression. So a massive amount of the gene expression in plants is controlled by the circadian clock. So they have a rhythmic behavior. So we've been interested in two main questions in our lab um, over the last couple of years. And one of those questions is how ranges of ambient temperature is integrated to the oscillator to regulate clock function. And I'm not going to talk a lot about that today, but this is also a very important aspect of um, the circadian community, which we're still, you know, we're still investigating. The other aspect that we are interested in are what are some of the molecular mechanisms and key players that are controlled by the circadian clock to really enhance plant thermal tolerance. We use a variety of approaches in our group to address these questions, uh, genomics to physiological approaches. Most of the work has been done in Arabidopsis that I'm going to show you today. Um, and we do have projects in other um, plant species that I'm not going to have time to talk about. And the idea is that we're going to be able to, we would like to be able to identify um, candidate genes that we can use, we can either manipulate in plants, whether Arabidopsis or other plant species, to make plants more resilient to changes in the environment. So as I mentioned today, I'm gonna to primarily be talking on the output aspect of our work. So I'm gonna be talking about how heat stress primarily impacts layers of gene expression. Over the past 25 years, there's been a lot of studies showing either targeted studies or genome-wide studies showing that uh, the clock is able to get the response to environmental stress signal, right? Whether it be light or drought or more recently with heat. And the way that it does that, it's really by sensing the same stimulus and depending on the time of day, you get a different response, right? Say the stimulus is sensed at a time when it's not conducive, the gate is closed, 
you have a weaker response versus if that same stimulus is given at a different time of the day. And what it does is that it modulates the uh, gene expression of genes that are involved in different uh, plant functions, right? So it changes the magnitude of that transcriptional response depending on time of day. And a few years ago, our lab did some work where we wanted to see whether or not this was also the effect for heat stress, um, because this was one aspect, this was one um, area of the cloud that wasn't really well studied in terms of temperature stress. So uh, Emily Blair, PhD student in my lab at that time, did a really, uh, uh, a really genome-wide experiment looking at two different times of the day in the morning reflected here at CT1 and also in the afternoon at CT6. And she subjected these plants to an hour of heat stress at 37 degrees Celsius and then we looked to see how the transcriptome um, has been modified. And indeed what we found was that you do have specific responses depending on time of day and we refer to these as the occurrence, right? So you have the response either in the morning um, or in the afternoon. But we also have responses where you do see a change regardless of time of day, but just that magnitude of the response that's different, okay? So we wanted to pursue this further, and we really wanted to look at other levels of gene regulation. And we knew from you know, many groups and many studies, this is just to review summarizing some of those studies, that temperature impacts different level of cloud gene expression. We knew ambient temperature plays a role in the transcription of cloud genes, in splicing, phosphorylation, and also the ability of these proteins to bind to their target genes in DNA binding. The area where we didn't have a lot of information was at the translation level and also outside of, outside of that range of ambient temperature, right? When you started looking at more extreme temperatures such as heat stress. So we took this opportunity to try to discover whether or not to see what or to, to, to try to understand what's happening at the level of translation um, in response to heat stress. And we had very similar questions going into this study as well, right? We wanted to see whether or not circadian oscillations in general was conserved between the transcriptome and the translatum. In terms of heat stress, we wanted to see, you know, do we see that same gating response that we observe at the transcriptome level, at the translatome level? And can might we identify targets that show a particular time of day response at both levels of regulation that could be good candidates for uh, future genetic man manipulation? So a very brilliant postdoc in the lab at that time, uh, to Tom Bernard undertook this project where we decided to look at a translatome by doing a time series experiment where we subjected the plants to an hour of heat stress every three hours over the course of the day. And we also did a recovery experiment because we always want, we also wanted to understand how the um, uh, genome is responding, is recovering after this heat stress. And what he did was a transcriptomic analysis for comparison and we also did a translatome analysis to understand whether or not, uh, to, or to look at the translatome, the way we approached that was by doing uh, a technique or using a technique called TRAP-seq. What this technique allows you to do is to capture mRNAs that are bound by ribosome, and this suggests that they're actively being translated. And that way we can use this for a comparison. I don't have a lot of time, obviously, to go into too much detail about all of these analysis. So I'm gonna to try to summarize it. So for the first question, is the, is the transcriptome and translatome um, show similar behavior in terms of the oscillations? And we do see a nice conservation between transcriptome and the translatome, huge conservation between these two mRNA populations, and so most of the genes are shared. We also observe similarity in terms of phases, right? So the phase seems to be conserved, zero here meaning that it's conserved, and uh, differences outside of this range, whether it's one hour to two hours to three hours um, a share. But the majority seems to have similar phase of expression. Um, when we also compare the transcriptome and translatome, one of the things that we uh, observe, and these are kind of the uh, uh, information we were trying to gather from this study as well, can we see differences between these two mRNA populations? And we did observe a subset of uh, transcripts that seems to be specific, meaning that they're only oscillating at the translatome level um, in our studies and also in all of the other studies that we've compared it to. 
So this was interesting. I'm not going to talk about a whole lot about what those transcripts are. Many of them seems to be involved in, um, in the cell cycle regulation. So now looking at how heat stress actually perturbed the entire uh, uh, genome at the translatome level, you can see this heat map is just really just to emphasize that there are difference, there are perturbations between the two mRNA population at 37 versus 22. And this is also a summary. So in terms of how is it impacting the translatome? What we found uh, through a series of analysis was the time of day time of day gets the response of about 36% of the heat stress responsive uh, transcripts as we observed. And these are just two examples I'm showing you, Gigantia and the CCG uh, binding protein one here. What we observed was that more than half of the upregulated uh, transcripts responded when the stress occurred before or after, but not during the peak of abundance. And that's what's kind of highlighted here with GI as an example, right? Where you see this upregulation prior or after the actual peak of um, expression. And for down regulated genes, we notice that you see a significant down regulation during that peak of um, expression, right? So this kind of suggested to us that, you know, genes that are maybe at their lowest expression are. Uh, in response to heat stress are selectively transcribed and tra translated, while genes that are peaking might not be and might not directly be involved in the heat stress response are not as um, actively uh, translated. I didn't have time, I'm not gonna have time to talk about recovery, but what we did notice was that the majority of the genes at the transcript at translatum level seems to recover within one hour. Okay, so they recover very quickly after the heat stress. Um, um, and that's, again, very specific to the time of the day that we actually did the analysis. So we wanted to also use this data to identify targets that show a time of day effect at different times of the day, and that's also shared between the transcriptome and the translatome. We chose to look at transcription factors because these are, uh, you know, genes that are involved in many different types of uh, abiotic stress responses and serve as real uh, major hubs for these responses. So we looked at transcription factors. We found 180 transcription factors that shows this time of day response that we were interested in. And we can look within those transcription factor families for different responses to heat stress. And this is just a uh, subfamily of the drug transcription factor showing that different families, members within a subfamily show very different responses. And these are kind of the uh, features that we're looking at, we were looking for. So now what we're trying to do is use this information to see whether or not we can select targets within certain transcription factor family at the subfamily level if there's differences to see whether or not we can manipulate these genes and see which might be responsible for a particular response depending on the time of day. And it's a huge, of course, project. We have many different candidates that we're interested in. So this is just a, a schematic showing candidates that we can select for four different periods throughout the day. So we're selecting candidates that are show time of day effect in the morning, afternoon, night, and middle. And this work is being performed by a great uh, a PhD student, Sabrina Gilmore, and our undergraduate student, who is going through a series of manipulation through uh, publicly available mutant lines and also CRISPR editing to see whether or not we can sh um, figure out the contribution of these genes. So we have a lot of outstanding questions, of course, outside of this study. We still would like to know, can hygiene, can hygiene responsiveness when the transcript levels are low, have a more significant impact, right, than low response need during the peak of transcript abundance. We would also like to know, you know, can genes peak at the same time of the day as a given stress signal, but not responding to the stress, be potential regulators of the responses to that stimulus? And more importantly, what we're also, what we would like to really be able to do next is what are the temporal dynamics of protein abundance, protein interactions, and complex formation in response to heat stress? If you're on this webinar and looking for a postdoc position, I highly encourage you to send me an email um, to, to um, if you're interested in this work. So I'm going to very quickly, because I'm sure I'm almost out of time, I'm just going to quickly finish up with the last two slides. 
So this work really um, uh, inspired us to really develop a way for not just our lab, but also for the community to be able to visualize all of these information from this data set. So with the help of the brilliant postdoc um, Tetuan Bonat and uh, Morgan Gilliard, we developed this Shiny app to allow um, users to visualize their particular gene of interest and how they respond to heat stress over time. I'm not going to go into detail of all of the uh, different features of this app, but it's a really beautiful app where you're able to look at individual genes, look at the circadian profile, how the, your gene might be responding to heat stress, the recovery profile, and you can also look at entire gene families, right? You can choose to put your gene families um, into this data set, or you can use our existing transcription factor family that's available. But it's a really easy way for you to look at a large subset of genes and in terms of how their um, behavior is. So I will skip over, in the interest of time, I will skip over many, uh, two of these very last slides. One last thing I want to uh, highlight, which is kind of a, um, a great feature of this app as well, is to look at phase right, timing of peak expression. So many times you have a data set where you have genes that might be oscillating and you're interested to see, to see whether or not there is an enrichment in terms of the timing of peak expression within that population. And we've developed a, uh, an option on that web where you can actually input your data, um, input your data, use a reference data set where you know the timing of information. You can also provide your own and look to see whether or not you see an enrichment of phase that's, uh, and then you have a you know, beautiful schematic that's popped out and also a summary of some of that data. So I highly encourage you to check out that app if you haven't um, done so yet, um, if you're interested in seeing whether or not your genes are um, responding to heat stress at the translatum level. So there's many other features I didn't talk about, um, which I encourage you to look at as well. We do have a multi-species circadian oscillator where we have different um, plant species available in that data set. What we don't have is the heat stress response or abiotic stress response for those data sets, which we're hoping to be able to get in the future as more and more of these studies come out. So to acknowledge the people who did this work, a huge effort of most or most of what I talked about today was done by Dr. Tutuan Bonat, who is now an independent researcher at Inri and Dijon. The app was uh, developed and also some of the statistical analysis in some of that work was done by Dr. Morgan Gilliard. The transcriptomic analysis, the original transcriptomic analysis was done by Emily Blair. And there's many other people in the lab that are like Tang for helping with these analysis and then just the funding sources that helps to make this work possible. So with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Don, for this very nice talk. Uh, there is a question in the chat, uh, two questions related to splicing. So I'm going to read one of them um, from Andres Romanowski. Uh, beautiful talk, Don. Did you by any chance look at how mRNA isoforms change with the time point specific heat shocks? And if so, have you seen if the retention of introns led to uh, premature stop codons and nonsense mediated decay? And this happens in response to stress, but I don't think it has been looked at from other diurnal circadian perspective. That's so, a great um, question. Yeah, that's a great question, Andre. Uh, we haven't done that um, for this particular data set. We are trying to do this for some work that we're doing in Sorghum, but we haven't done this for this data set. And it's on our radar to do. We just haven't gotten to it yet. But thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I think for the um, to give a bit the, the time, maybe we'll go to the to the next speaker uh, now. Um, uh, so the, the last speaker today is Todd Michael. Todd Michael is a researcher, uh, a research professor in the Plant Molecular and Cellular Biology Lab in Salk Institute in San Diego. And before joining the Salk Institute in 2019, uh, Dr. Michael had academic positions at the Rogers University and the Craig Venter Institute, and also industry positions at Monsanto and Abbott Laboratories where his group sequenced thousands of plant, animals, and microbial genomes. Dr. Michael obtained his PhD from Dartmouth College with Rob McClung, where he focused on the role of circadian clock in controlling time of, time of day specific gene expression. His lab is focused on building tools for pan-genome analysis 
and leveraging time of day networks to develop crops that sequester more carbon to fight climate change. And this is under the SOLX Harnessing Plant Initiative. So Todd, uh, we're looking forward for your talk. Uh, for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invite and thank the editors for putting together this special issue. Um, fantastic work. Uh, this talk that um, I'm going to give in the, the article in the special issue um, basically it was a culmination of many, many years of observations of plant genomes. <clears throat> Let's see. So my, my group mostly focuses on sequencing plant genomes and other genomes, but mostly plants. And with, with an eye towards really strange plants, like carnivorous plants, like Genlysia aurea, that basically doesn't have any leaves and only has um, traps. Um, and then plants that like, well, witchia that only make two leaves its entire life cycle, or duckweeds that are um, fast growing and minimal um, plants, or um, a very specific area that we're very interested in is CAM photosynthesis. And um, so a lot of this work involves sequencing these novel genomes to understand the architecture and how that fits with the function. To understand the function though, we generally think of a genome, not just as the DNA sequence, but the underlying time of day transcriptome. So for almost all our studies, we do look at the, the time of day expression so that we can see the networks underlying it. More recently, my group has been moving on to looking at many genomes at the same time through pangenomics. And right now we're generating pangenomes for cassava, cannabis, soybean, alfalfa, um, and lots of different species of duckweed. And this work is um, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, many of these pan genomes or genomes that we're creating are towards the goal of generating the salk ideal plants that we're hoping will capture more carbon and store it in recalcitrant carbon in the roots. Um, and um, currently um, all the salk plant faculty um, are working on this funded by Bezos and the Audacious Project and a subset funded by HHMI. So much of my interest in time of day networks started off um, as a postdoc when we looked at how many genes are regulated by the circadian clock and light and temperature in Arabidopsis. And what we found is that almost all transcripts are cycling at a specific time of day in Arabidopsis. And that depending on the condition that you look at, you see different um, numbers of genes and different phases of the genes. And by looking at these different patterns, you can start to understand aspects of the fundamental biology. So uh, when I started my own lab, we took on a species that I had always been very interested in um, as a graduate student because of the work of William Hillman at Brookhaven, where he actually used duckweed and specifically lemna to elucidate photopuric flowering. I was interested in duckweed because it seemed like a great model to look at very specific biology, specifically photosynthesis in a minimalist system. Um, this led to some work on the smallest of the duckweed, Wolfia australiana, that basically is a ball of about 5,000 cells. Um, however, our original hypothesis was that it would have you know, every, every gene would be regulated by the circadian clock or diurnal um, changes in light and temperature, but it turned out that very few genes were regulated and these genes were almost all, all um, involving photosynthesis. We extended this work now to look at um, the single cell, so breaking up all 5,000 cells and then looking at um, what's going on at dawn and dusk. Um, and seeing what are the changes in these networks. However, one of the things that we noted um, in all the genomes we've been looking at, but this really jumped out in terms of the duckweed genomes that we had sequenced, is that we always find the PERR and single MIB transcription factors associated with one another. And so what I'm showing you here is basically a symphony plot between Spiridella polyrhiza, the greater duckweed, and then two different uh, genomes of Wolfia australiana. And this is a synteny plot where 
the gray bars are just the general genes and then either red is the PRRs or um, gold is LHY. And this was interesting because I had noted in almost every genome that we sequenced in the Dicot lineage that these genes were associated. And this goes back to work when I was a graduate student when the genome was first um, sequenced for Arabidopsis. And we found that PR9 and CCA1 were right next to one another in the genome and that PR7 and RV4 were right next to each other in the genome. So I decided, well, we have all these genomes. I wanna see if this is a general phenomenon. So now I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of like what's going on here. Now, when you think about plant genomes, they've gone through several rounds of what we call whole genome duplication, uh, retention and fractionization. And what's happening here is that you actually have a whole genome duplication where LHY and CCA1 were duplicated and the PR9 that used to be next to the LHY was fractionated. The same is true with RV8 and um, RV4 uh, in relation to uh, PR7. So to show you this in um, across all plants, so Arabidopsis has two whole genome duplications, recent whole genome duplications, the alpha and the beta, and then it has an older whole genome triplication, the lambda. And so if you look at how um, these duplications work, you start off with the um, original ancestor genome, you get the first duplication, and then you basically have fractionization of specific genes. And in this case, you are left with just the CCA1 and PR9 connection, whereas you are left with LHY on um, chromosome one. So one of the things I wanted to do is go back to the sister lineage, Amborella, and ask, can we actually trace this connection all the way back? And so you can, um, although they're not right next to each other in Amborella. They are 27 genes apart, and that's about a megabase. And that got me thinking, oh, well, that's interesting that they're close together. Um, you know, do they actually get um, closer together over evolutionary time? So I decided to look at um, grape, which only has the whole genome triplication, the lambda triplication, and ask, you know, do we see the same relationship? And what we found was that both linkages between PR9 and, in this case, LHY, and then PR7 and RVE are actually retained in the grape lineage. However, they are several genes apart. Now, if you look at this in contrast to um, Arabidopsis, basically what you're seeing is that over evolutionary time, these genes are coming closer and closer together. And then in Arabidopsis, there are only several genes apart. Now, this could be just you know, randomly happening every once in a while. So I asked if you look at a, whole, a different whole genome duplication, retention and fractionization event, do you see the same thing? So this is tomato going from umbrella to grape to tomato. And what you can see is you get the same fractionization and over whole genome duplication, duplication, they're actually moving closer together. So the, now the question is like, how often does this actually happen? So I looked across all of the currently, high current, um, currently available high quality plant genomes. And this is just representing different families, but pretty much, I can find this relationship across the entire angiosperm lineage. And specifically, and most importantly, you get all the different combinations. So in other words, across all different whole duplication events, you get different combinations of the LHY PR9 or CC1 PR9, RV4 PR7, so on and so forth. I want to point out, though, that basically RV4 and CCA1 are very specific to the brassicas, and you know you don't see those outside of that family. One of the things that really jumped out at me, though, is that soybean has retained uh, six of the eight potential copies um, through its whole genome duplications. And what I'm showing you here is that PR9 and LHY, all four versions are retained across the genome. However, 
while most of the expression patterns are conserved, there is one PRN9 that is not conserved. Now, this is particularly interesting because soybean um, is broken up into maturity groups in terms of how it's used in agriculture. And those maturity groups, it's been shown by Rob McClung's group that they coincide with um, specific period relationships with the environment. So one of the big questions is, is there a reason why these have been retained? And how far back have these actually been retained? So I started moving backwards in the tree and asked like, do we see this retention? And so what I'm showing you here is sequoia. There's a really nice sequoia genome that's available now. And then Amborella on the bottom here. And Amborella has 18 genes separating uh, PR and the um, single mid family. However, in Sequoia, it's 51 genes. So it's a much bigger area. So, but they're still on the same chromosome. So it seems as though over evolutionary time, we're seeing this connection um, and then getting closer and closer in the angiosperms. So how far back is this um, conserved? So I looked all the way back to Austriococcus. Austriococcus is a single celled um, algae that had, has a functional clock that's been very nicely elucidated. Um, however, these genes are on separate chromosomes in Austriococcus. The same is true in Clematomotus and then also in the moss um, Fiscometrella. However, what we see in sphagnum, also a moss, but a very distantly related moss, is that the genes start to come together on the same chromosomes. And there's quite a few copies in sphagnum. And then you can go from sphagnum to see how they come together in Amborella, and then Arabidopsis, and then Spiridella, like I've shown you. Now, the one unusual thing that's going on here is that when we get to the grasses, specifically the grasses, you lose this relationship. So basically in all grasses that I've looked at so far, these genes have moved to separate chromosomes. So if we take a larger view and to reiterate what we've seen in Austriococcus, they're on separate chromosomes. In um, sphagnum, we start to see them on the same chromosome, Ambrella and Sequoia. And then what we see is that they start to move closer together. And there's a very interesting change that's going on here. This is when the angiosperms emerge. Um, <clears throat> and you get a very specific burst of whole genome duplications. And then finally, you get another burst of whole genome duplications and you get what we call the rise of the grasses and when grasses become um, dominant in the landscape. Um, so another way to summarize this is graphically, you basically have algae where you have all, you have functional circadian clock, but these genes are on different chromosomes. You see them coming together in um, the moss and gymnosperm lineage. But then at, in the angiosperm lineage, you see this very interesting split where um, some monocots and the non-grass monocots specifically still have this linkage like banana. Um, and then you have the linkage in grape. However, you start to, you lose this linkage in the grasses. And one hypothesis is it actually is related to the way that these plants are pollinated um, and what we see is that in the rise to the in, rise of the angiosperms, flowering plants generate this very interesting relationship with their pollinator. However, the survival and abundance and um, uh, rise to superior, superiority of the grasses is related to their wind pollination and moving away from the reliance on a pollinator. So we, we're hypothesizing that possibly that is one of the reasons why these genes have been linked together in the angiosperms to uh, preserve clock function, but that for some reason that's not necessary through wind pollination. And I will end with that. Um, I wanna thank my group. So we have lots of lively discussion about the circadian clock um, and we're always looking for new genomes to sequence. So if you have any suggestions of novel or interesting genomes, please let me know. And I do wanna highlight that um, Kelly and my group um, designed the cover for this. And I think it's fantastic. She did an incredible job.
and Kelly's on the end over here. With that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Todd. Um, going to now to read a few questions. Uh, so, hi, Todd. Besides MIPS, are there other gene families so in linkage? So besides this MIPS and uh, BRR, have you so seen that? So that is that is a great question be, um, because I actually left that out of this because I wanted just to focus on talking about um, the very specific circadian core circadian clock genes. Um, but in the paper, we do also talk about PIF3 and PHI-A, which are also shown to be uh, linked across evolutionary time and come closer together. And now I've extended this to looking at all light flowering time and um, tangential circadian genes. Um, and there's a whole host of genes. And I guess I should have said, and I, I didn't say, that it's been shown in bacteria and prokaryotes that genes are linked together in the genome. However, in general, in eukaryotes, that's not the case, um, except when you're talking about meta metabolic pathways. So this is a very interesting situation where you have a non-metabolic gene family that are becoming linked in the genome for some reason. And right now I've found up to about 20 different linkages in the flight, flowering time, and circadian clock families. Now in this paper, we highlighted just three, um, the core clock genes and PIF3 and PHI-A, um, but they all basically follow the same trajectory of getting closer together, suggesting that there's some relevance to them being co-localized in the genome. And it's not because of expression level. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next question, uh, given that some cyanobacteria clock genes sit on a single operon, clock uh, gene physical association could be common theme across life. Is there a selection for clock gene linkage in the animal kingdom? Hmm. Well, I actually haven't looked at that. That is a that would be a really cool thing to look at. I I mean in my in my experience, I don't think I've seen that clock genes are linked in, outside of well in in um, non plant systems. So that would be something great to look at, actually. Thank you. And the last uh, quick question: Have you looked at all at at polyploid plants? Is linkage affected by poly polyploidy? Um, so we have looked. Um, I, I didn't highlight it because I didn't show you all the genomes that we find linkage. Um, but yes, there we don't see any difference in polyploid plants. They basically have all the same linkages um, when we can resolve them. So I mean, we've only really been resolving accurately polyploid genomes over the last two or three years. Um, but every single polyploid genome that we looked at in this study, um, we found linkage, except in the grasses. Okay. Oh, well, thank you very much, Todd. That was a very nice talk. And thank you very much for all to all the few speakers uh, for very nice talks and for answering the questions. And now I... Uh, Mary, it's gonna be Thank you. Those were amazing talks. Um, visit the plant physiology website to um, to get links to all of them. Um, Todd, I just want to say I spent most of my graduate career asking animal biologists if they'd ever looked at this in plants and always getting that answer. Oh, I never looked at that. So I was pretty excited when you said, oh, I never thought to look at animals. <laughs> I, I kind of like a little bit of revenge there. <laughs> but brilliant, wonderful talks. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Ava. Thank you, Dawn. James, Todd, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.